Mm, so this is a one-hour panel. Um, we will have initially a panel discussion, and then uh, we will open up for uh, questions from the audience. So to begin with, I think uh, maybe it, it will be good if uh, every one of our panelists uh, could really shortly just uh, introduce yourself and uh, present uh, what is it that you're working on that relates to the Internet of Things or to the Internet of Smart Things. Clément, do you want to start? Uh -huh. So my name is Clément Epier. Uh, I'm from France. I'm co-founder of uh, Cell Labs. And what we do is we are working to apply blockchain with our emerging technology. So let's say you put blockchain with drones, uh, research in uh, pharmaceutical research, uh, space imagery, and this kind of thing. At the same time, we help, uh, we try to help the blockchain community to work in a more collaborative way. Hi, my name is uh, Eric Jennings. I'm the CEO of Filament. And, um, we are building a uh, hardware product that connects uh, industrial infrastructure to the internet, but we actually leverage a lot of aspects of the blockchain to do so and to enable new business models for us to be able to, um, to realize devices that can discover each other, interact with each other securely, and then even transact value with each other. Uh, we just so happen to be doing that through this industrial focus. So uh, I'm Peter Acero. I'm a professor at the New School in New York City and also at the Center for IT Policy at Princeton University. I do a lot of work on robotics and autonomous systems in the physical world, looking at questions of liability, questions of privacy. Uh, and I also have a, an NGO that's been working on uh, arms control around fully autonomous weapon systems at the United Nations. Après, on va développer un legal research at Harvard. I'm Henning Dietrich, I'm working at IBM, and I'm working with a group at IBM called MTN that is um, creating a fabric where you can have untrusted and devices that don't know each other enter into negotiations and contracts with each other so that you can facilitate a way to let the Internet of Things grow. Uh, I'm Gustav Simonson, I, I'm a developer at Ethereum. Uh, focusing on core protocols and the uh, the Golang client. Um, I have a bit of background in embedded devices, and I've been helping some projects using the um, Ethereum Golang client for um, I IoT devices. Okay, thank you. So, I think perhaps to to begin, um, there's this uh, this is actually a question. It's a personal question, I guess, because. Every time we talk about the Internet of Things, and in particular the Internet of Smart Things, somehow there is always those two examples that come, which is the intelligent fridge and the autonomous car. And um, I guess those are really good examples, but I think it will be interesting to hear from the panelists if you actually have some more um, detailed or some different example as to uh, what is the Internet of uh, Smart Things, and uh, in particular when we talk about blockchain technology, what are good examples of uh, devices that can be incorporated with the blockchain in order to promote the Internet of Smart Things? I'll start. Um, you know, the smart fridge is becoming the cliche now, right? And in fact, there's a, a Twitter handle that I follow that was tweeting the support uh, section of Samsung uh, their website yesterday talking about how people were very frustrated that the Google Calendar API broke on their refrigerator and they can no longer see their calendar on the refrigerator. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a meme now. It's kind of hilarious. There is such a larger aspect to connecting things to each other that, you know, it really, it, it really must be seen in a more holistic or ma macro view, in our opinion. Um, you know, the, the numbers are crazy. If you look at what people like Cisco are putting out, 50 billion devices by 2020, um, it's another, another research report we saw showed that by 2020, the Internet of Things infrastructure will be larger than the entire telecommunications and, and, uh, and telco infrastructure in total size. So, I mean, this is, these are massive, massive numbers. And so when we start going to this Internet scale of devices being deployed, it's super critical, we believe, essential actually, to think of this in a much more um, mindful way. So when you start talking about connected fridges and whatnot, that seems to be the initial kind of go-to because people can map from here today to this future that is kind of foggy. Um, we see a huge benefit in connecting industrial infrastructure. Um, again, I look through this lens because this is the world we live in in our company. But industrial infrastructure is, is huge. If you look at, again, looking at industrial infrastructure versus things like home automation and wearables, it's more than twice as big uh, in terms of just total deployments, trillions of dollars of assets like pipelines and power grids and agricultural plots all exist today 
and 71% of them are disconnected. So if you just look at it through this industrial lens, there's so much opportunity that, quite frankly, we would love more competition because there's just so much work to do that we cannot possibly even hit even a part of it. We're trying our best, and we're going as fast as we can as a, as a scrappy startup, but um, I believe there's so much impact to happen there that it will fundamentally drive down costs of you know grids and power and utility and even commons we think of today. Um, and, uh, and this is not in the realm of connected you know, calendars and refrigerators at all. So what do you think will be the killer app of uh, the Internet of Smart Things? It's very dangerous to predict the future, because <laughs> you're always wrong. Uh, I would hedge a bet that the killer app for Internet of Things will be when devices are autonomous, in the sense that they can discover other devices directly um, and actually interact and, and, and transact with each other. Henning's group. Um, is doing amazing work. We've actually tried to get to work with them more. Um, and obviously, IBM is, is evolving as a company as well in terms of how they see this world. But they had the, uh, the Adept group, which worked on this a while ago. Um, people like John Cohn in their group, and, and prior to that, uh, Paul Brody. Very, very smart people thinking about this concept. I think it will be when devices can discover each other and they can transact at machine speed, when they don't need people to help them do the thing that they want to do. And they, you can call it the smart contract piece, whatever the code is that helps those people, those devices actually interact, is will be the killer app. I do have no idea what will be on top of that. I really don't. It's, it's like trying to say what the internet was going to be in 1962. I have no idea, but I know it'll be huge. Yeah, I, would, I would like to add to that. I mean, uh, of course, you cannot forget the self-servicing washer, right, that was uh, introduced at, uh, this year by Samsung and IBM in Las Vegas. And these examples, of course, have the charm that people can connect to that. I mean, everybody understands the washer and what it needs, no matter what profession you're in. And this is why they are being pushed to the forefront at this point, because, of course, people try to create this market, create the awareness. But um, as Eric just said, um, the overall potential of this entire market is so huge, um, just not just from all the devices that come, but also all the product, all the um, players in the markets. It's so many that's so fractured uh, if you don't have standards that you can go by, and which makes it so important to have a common infrastructure to be able to plug these things into each other. But generally, for the Internet of Things and for smart things, you do have success stories in the industry, and my favorite example jet engines that are monitored, they are monitored 24 seven. And actually what's being sold now as a business model is flight hours. You don't buy jet engines anymore, that's the actual reality of it. And the same way that Rolls Royce now is basically billing flight hours driven by its jet engines, I think we will see that we will in the future be getting used to just uh, assume that we have a washing service, although it's our own washing machine maybe. And it might even be in the shared economy spirit shared with our neighbors. But we will get a whole different idea about what a product is. And w in the end, what we need is our laundry being done. And we don't have to own that washing machine. And we might see that this idea of everybody owning their own washing machine, and it's only in use like 20 or 10% of the time that we own it, is going to go away. Yeah, I'll just add to that real fast. We actually spoke with Hitachi Data Systems, and they also now sell their locomotive systems the same way that Rolls-Royce sells their jet engines. It used to be that they would sell the, the train, the passenger cars, the rail system, the ticketing system separately. And for a purchaser like the City of London to buy that, it's very, very difficult because it's very hard to actually calculate your ROI. It's really hard to figure out hidden costs, service agreements, maintenance contracts, internal training that needs to happen with people who need to actually maintain this device or this machine, the system. They now sell it per seat per year, and they put the whole thing together. Right? So it's like what's fascinating is that these very top level, very expensive assets are now starting to be sold as this as a use or as a service model. And where we think it's really interesting is when you start driving that down to less capital asset intensive um, devices and machines. What if you could buy the washing machine like that? What if you could buy the power drill per use or per day? Um, how does it work? Not sure exactly. We think it's actually very compelling though when instead of, you know, the example I like to use is that power drills that, you, that end users buy. Customers buy for like you know drilling a hole in the wall at their home. It's, uh, the average amount of time it's actually on is between seven and thirteen minutes for its lifetime, and the rest of the time it sits in the closet or the garage. What if you could just pay per use and then pass it on to someone else? What if there's this kind of, kind of this joint commons or tool library or something? Fascinating things start to emerge when you can actually enforce or require as a use payment methods on the device itself. 
Yeah, to, uh, I mean, maybe we can agree on that the killer app will probably emerge in the kind of junction of the sharing economy, which is something that's completely independently having developing a thrust in the, in the awareness of people and the Internet of Things that comes from a different direction right now, but they will meet, and they're meeting already. And uh, I think if you throw digital payment into that, and then hopefully some intelligent regulation about insurance and tax that doesn't break the business models, I think we will see incredibly interesting things there. Um, yeah. And uh, so for instance, Gustav, what about um, so Ethereum? Uh, like, what will be, what in your view, what will be like um, uh, one of the most important, significant application of smart contracts into uh, devices? Uh, I, I agree that it's really hard to predict what's going to happen, but I think what we're seeing now, um, both in products uh, at IBM and other products, is that um, people are experimenting with embedding uh, smart contracts in these devices where you might map um, a single Ethereum smart contract with uh, each device uh, and have the device uh, actually holding funds that it can spend in various ways depending on um, autonomous conditions in that device. There are, even steel, there are even steel plants right now. There are steel plants right now that do that, right? <coughs> Plantoid. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's like two sort of key ways in which the blockchain could be super useful to the Internet of Things, which is a little bit what we talked about, which is the ability to do transactions, which is also your ability to sort of do a transaction with a device that may not be directly on a, an Internet or on a centralized network. So a bike sharing system, right? So you can just walk up and pay for the bike, and the bike can verify the receipt, something like that. But I think this much bigger area that's much more interesting for me is privacy, which is that the idea that when you make these kinds of transactions, and especially because essentially what the Internet of Things is going to be is a lot of sensors. And these sensors are going to be gathering lots of data. And there's a huge question about the privacy, that what that means for public space, what that means for individual privacy. These are devices that are going to be recording data about people who have not entered any kind of contract or negotiation or anything right, with the system. So our existing notions of legal ramifications for privacy are notifying consent. So I'm going to tell you that I'm going to record you. You're going to consent to being recorded. Now I own this information. I can do whatever I want with it. Um, and that's a sort of one-time transition. But I think what's really fascinating about the blockchain is that we could actually have partial permissions. And we can keep that information private and secret. And so some sorts of information could be utilized. And I wish we had somebody from Enigma on the panel. I think they're in the other room. Um, but that you could actually do computations of certain kinds on private information without revealing it, and thus without sort of relinquishing it indefinitely or irrevocably. Um, but you have the ability then to say, OK, this kind of information can be shared with these people or for these purposes, and this other information is not shared in that way. So you can get the value of certain kinds of aggregate data and, say, being able to determine traffic flows and you know, where the traffic congestion is on Google Maps without revealing every individual's patterns of movement in a city. Right? I think if we can uh, figure out how to do that, that's the killer privacy app that's going to really enable an Internet of Things that doesn't completely destroy our entire framework of privacy. Okay, so actually, this, uh, this, this draws to the next question, which is um, so the Internet of Things is actually something that we've been talking about for uh, many years now. And um, so, what is it in, in fact that, uh, what is the actual difference when we shift from the Internet of Things? to the Internet of Smart Things. And uh, what are, so of course there is like all this uh, discussion about the device which is now able to host its own funds. But then beyond that, uh, what is it that makes the Internet of Things smarter when we incorporate blockchain technology into this? Like what are the, what are the benefits that we get from blockchain technology, which allows us to go beyond what we have with the Internet of Things? Well, I mean, just to continue what I was saying before, right? So if you have a sensor that's just collecting data and streaming the data, it's a sort of stupid sensor, right? It's like, this is the temperature, and I'm just going to keep broadcasting the temperature. But if you have a system that has processing capabilities to understand context, and we heard that in the keynote this morning, context is what's crucial. So if I can understand, well, when somebody says something out loud, 
you know, or directly to the device, that's a sort of something I need to transmit. If somebody's whispering in somebody's ear, like that's a secret. So that's the device that's smart enough to distinguish an interpersonal s communication that's s trying to be secret from one that's trying to be public. Uh, that makes it smart, and it, but it has to have that underlying technology to be able to encode that differently uh, in terms of privacy settings and how that information actually gets distributed. I'll, I'll add to that, I, I completely agree. The, the privacy aspect is actually step zero. Like it, some people call it security in IoT and actually privacy is the more important piece because um, while they're two sides of a coin, um, if we get privacy wrong in IoT, we're all screwed really badly. And so it's very, very, very important. I really applaud Peter and other people who are working in this area. Um, you know, we also take privacy quite seriously um, and are doing everything we can to try to find ways to keep that privacy um, intact. Uh, through various protocols like telehash that we're developing and some other ones, and it's very, very key to get that right. But one thing about um, IoT that I think when you go from Internet of Things to Internet of Smart Things, it's, uh, you know, and maybe this is, maybe I'm showing my decentralized roots a little bit, but, uh, you know, we, a lot of people in this IoT space talk about cloud connectivity and big data analytics and predictive analytics where you can predict when your machine's going to break because you can start doing all these great Hadoop, you know, transforms on it and, and big data type of insights. We're big believers that I don't think we'll be able to scale with 50 billion devices all trying to talk to the cloud all the time. The telcos love this, the cable companies love this because it just means more bandwidth through their pipes. But fundamentally, we, we believe that devices should be able to talk to each other, just like people talk to each other. If, if Primavera and I always had to go through a, a third party mediator to even communicate, um, that would slow down and f add friction to a communication channel that probably shouldn't, especially if we're in the same room together. So if there's devices that can talk to each other directly via radio, they probably should, um, if they can. If there's a, this ability to be able to establish trust, um, the work that you know Henning's group is doing to try to make sure that there's a way that two devices from different manufacturers can actually negotiate and say, yep, this is what I'm offering. If there's a price tag on it, I can add it. That is really core to making the IoT, IOST, <laughs> Internet of Smart Things, I guess. Um, instead of thinking cloud-centric, the cloud we, th we think should be seen as a peer in a peer-to-peer -peer network. That's probably a more appropriate model to look at it through. Yeah, I would, I would like to add to that that um, that this moving of the power towards the edge of the uh, whole grid, I mean, that, that's a very important uh, phenomenon that, uh, that we can see in all that. And the, the thing that adds into that is that we have a marketplace there all of a sudden. It's just, just communication, but it's a whole market that we can spin up. And it's just like markets can now be created using Ethereum um, in a way that before you couldn't, because you always had an overhead. You always had uh, markets that would be too small. And this is like, um, uh, to use a, a comparison, like uh, in the future we might have weather insurance. It will be normal to insure your wedding um, against rain. This is just a market that right now cannot work because the overhead is too big. But Ethereum can make that possible. And going forward, this might become as normal for us uh, as using a mobile phone for all kinds of things, as we do now which were hard to imagine 15 years ago even. But going forward, this will also happen in between, uh, this will happen between devices and small devices because they can create a market among themselves in any location, in any uh, installation without the cost of overhead that it used to have because these markets are going to be fully automated. And this has tremendous dimension, uh, potential. I mean, this is just a quantum leap in the sense of it's not just you, that you can do something faster than you could do before, or you could do it on a grander scale, but you can do new things, qualitatively new things. So, well, if I try and uh, recap uh, what I've been said, so basically the, the one of the main difference between Internet of Things and Internet for Smart Things is the ability for device-to-device uh, -device communication, which does not rely on this intermediary trusted party that uh, makes sure that the communication, that the transaction that are done within the device are, um, are, are valid, right? So it's this uh, trustlessness that is created between different uh, autonomous devices. Uh, which is great in the sense that therefore we don't need to communicate all the information all the time to the central authority. Now, 
This also means, however, just as uh, Vlad has uh, well described yesterday, that uh, when we enter into the more trustless the system is, then the harder it is also to control. And so, um, what does it mean? Like, what are the what, what does it mean to actually start delegating all those uh, tasks when we have those autonomous devices? Then we did more and more we delegate those tasks to the device that will act on their own, that will make decisions on their own. And there is a point in which what used to be the trusted authority that will actually control what was going on in within the devices, then if, if the coordinating uh, authority is no longer needed, then what are the risks of delegating all those 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 tasks to automated devices. What like what we the benefits are obviously clear, but what what is the potential risk that we encounter? Well, I, th I think it matters a lot, like what what the realm is, right? What the particular application is. So, a lot of what I work on on the international arms control front is looking at fully autonomous weapon systems. So these are systems that are designed to kill people. So it seems like a really bad idea to sort of make that autonomous for a number of kind of legal and moral reasons. Uh, and, and especially because of the lack of accountability for what those systems do, ultimately. I think that's a pretty key element of it. Um, now, you move that sort of same sort of line of thinking into, say, self-driving cars, right? Self-driving cars are not designed explicitly to kill people, right? They'll probably kill people because they're dangerous. Um, but your con the engineering is actually trying to minimize that harm rather than in weapon systems where you're trying to sort of maximize that harm. Uh, so I think there's a sort of moral difference, and we can, we can think about that and talk about what that means. But there's still issues about liability when you have autonomous systems. So are the is systems engineers responsible for certain kinds of accidents? Are uh, the companies that manufacture it and sell them, are the owners of the cars responsible? So that's a huge question that insurance companies are going to have to settle as well. Um, and it's still kind of unfolding. But I think, you know, I think that's a good thing if we can all ultimately minimize harms through that kind of system. If you have autonomous systems that are more dangerous or increasing risk, I think there you have to really think about why are you trying to automate that or why are you trying to remove any kind of human responsibility for that system. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I'll add to that that um, we going, we've gone down this very similar road in, in trying to figure out how to treat these devices if they become more autonomous. What, how, do you, how does a human... Um, expect to view this device. You know, from traditional property rights standpoints, we own things, like you own a refrigerator today, or you lease it. Um, we're trying, internally to our team, trying to start, st trying to stop using the word own, because it's, it's kind of becoming archaic in this new realm of rights. We're really now talking more about property rights or rights or access rights to a device's sensor data. And when you start splitting that apart now, it changes a lot of the dialogue in general about how you view and observe these devices? I mean, are, do they have inherent rights? And if so, what are they? And how do we build an entire legal structure around that? And I know that um, you know, Primavera and Aaron Wright wrote this really great paper that I read on the plane on the way over around this and kind of getting their head wrapped around what it means. Do we need a new law? And of, of course, you know, Larry Lessig's here, who's been thinking about this a very long time, about do we need a new way of looking at law now that we have this new world. At the time it was you know, cyber law, and now we've got Internet of Things world with, and, and blockchain law um, concepts that need to be considered. And so I think there's some really important research that's happening now that will continue to happen that will help inform people like us on how we need to think about these things, because it's not adequate with the frameworks we have today. They, they just don't seem to hold water anymore, and they start to, you know, you spend so much time trying to keep it from leaking that it, it becomes untenable. And so um, we're looking very much for some leadership and some, some efforts on that side to help inform how we think of it in our way, but it's becoming clear already that, that, that the current models and frameworks we have are just insufficient for what we're seeing coming up with the Internet of Things. If I could add to that, um, I'm, I tend to s see a very optimistic um, possibility there that um, in the moment we have a centralized way to apply rules to figure out which certain situations are legal or not or should have had a different outcome than they actually had in the real world, so it's reverted what happened. When we can, if we can transmit those rules, so to say, closer to the edge, that doesn't necessarily mean that things become less well-organized or less just or 
um, generally more dangerous, provided that the programming of these rules and transferring from the legal to the actual executional realm becomes, uh, is, is not too erroneous, then you could even expect that because every detail is being taken care of in the moment it happens, this kind of summary, uh, higher level approach that never really does the case justice um, could be overcome because things are going to happen in a very neutral and a predetermined way that is hopefully codifying what the actual contract was at the edge already. And even if something goes wrong, there could be hope that smaller processes could be uh, settled earlier in the whole structure. And it doesn't ha have to ruin the whole contract and go up to a centralized um, uh, point where it then can be solved. However, getting the programming right is, is the big task then here, because if you have a program that's not doing what it intended to, to what it was intended to do, and it's then distributed across uh, millions of devices, and they all do the same legal mistakes, so to say, in, in that moment, then you have a real problem. Yeah, I'll just add to that. You can even take it a step further, and, and when you have devices that start negotiating their own contracts, like then it's like, well, initially, I'm assuming there is a manufacturer or someone who puts that contract on the device to make it do a thing. What happens when that device now decides what its own contract is going to be and through an algorithm or through, you know, something? I mean, somewhere, somehow, someone's developing firmware to make this device do a thing. But if you give it more autonomy, um, then can it start establishing, you know, negotiating for with three other sensor, you know, manufacturers on getting its own temperature sensor? And if it had its own temperature sensor, it could aggregate it with its own sensor data and actually sell its data for ten times the amount. Should we do these things? And if so, then who owns that contract? The device, like, who or who's responsible? Who's culpable? Um, these are questions. There are answers that we don't have uh, for in our world yet. But I think that Henning's thinking of it correctly. Like, um, logic to the edge of the network is always better, in our opinion. Cisco's very big on this too. They talk about edge computing or fog computing, they call it, rather than cloud computing. And um, you know, you can snark at that a little bit, I do. Um, but it's the, the idea is correct, I think. Pushing logic to the edge of the network works better for systems theory standpoints. It actually allows a, a system to be more resilient to change. It can morph and adapt better. Um, central control is fine as long as it's always to the benefit of the individual actors, not the other way around. The actors don't ever exist to serve the central control, and we've learned this in society and government and all these other things. In networks, it actually is the same thing. So um, I totally, I totally agree with what Henning's saying, and um, and fundamentally, what we land on is like there's more questions than answers right now, which is kind of exciting and terrifying all at the same time. I think I think we may end up talking about it in the panels more in this afternoon about the regulation of decentralized systems, but. I think there's also a sort of question of why, why do you really want sort of devices to own themselves, for instance, right? Like why would anybody want to buy that, right? The company wants to retrieve the profit from this thing working for it, ultimately, or an individual or shareholders or, right? And so we could structure law and regulation such that these things always have to have some kind of trustees or board or shareholders who are ultimately humans, who are ultimately responsible whether you know there's a technical possibility of obscuring that or you know making that unretrievable or you can't ever turn the system off or something like that but yeah but dao right so but but there's still humans at some level and i think for legal purposes right we uh, the companies are a legal fiction as persons right um, we don't, they're not really persons, but we treat them that way in the law, but we could change the way the law applies and, and get rid of that legal fiction if we wanted to, right? But I think that's a huge burden to try to do in the legal system right now. But with these sorts of things, we'd say, well, no, there has to be human corporation and somebody has to own it and it could be very obscure, but there's you know these boundary conditions and the extreme cases, we can shut things down or we can find people who are responsible. Can I, can I add that to that? I mean, it's a great example about what kind of change in the law or in regulations could make a huge difference going forward. It's like, are we going to give to devices the same kind of jurisdictional reg personality right that we in the past have given to corporations, where there are movements to repeal that because it has many bad factors, right? So this is going to be hard decisions going forward that are going to influence a lot about what is going to be allowed and what, what can happen and what can become an industry. Um, with the device ownership, uh, with this quip almost that the device should own itself, well, it can do that if the legislation is transformed into something like that. But 
the de facto problem we have right now is that, of course, uh, legally you own your devices that you bought and have in your hands and have in your house, but effectively they're usually in the moment owned by the provider who is then remotely controlling them <laughs> And usually you don't have any idea. You can just sign off the, the terms of service, and they're usually not <laughs> very readable. You don't even know what you're signing off, really. And then the provider of these devices kind of owns them in that sense. And these two kinds of ownership, it would be really good to try to reconcile them into one, because in the moment, it, it gives the providers a lot of opportunity um, and even skirting uh, responsibilities in, in this very comfortable situation we have now. I think real fast, too, yeah. I mean, it. Uh, that's one of the best things, also one of the worst things about having a device that's somewhat autonomous is that you can also develop it in a way where it will no longer obey or listen to its manufacturer, right? So it's like, you can almost think of like, you know, a lot of the fear around IoT is, is siloing of data and, you know, if you don't pay for the product, you are the product. Who knows what the Nest thermostat sends back? Everyone has a hypothesis, no one knows. Um, people have tried to, you know, monitor their Wi-Fi routers to see what the hell is going up there. Um, if you could make this, and if you could add this kind of autonomy that says that once the device is made, maybe the contract says, I'm going to give, you know, the, the payment for use of this goes to the provider, but no data ever goes to the provider unless, uh, sorry, to the manufacturer, unless the manufacturer wants to is enter into a, a contract with the device it made to pay for that data, right? Why doesn't it become an autonomous market participant just like the device is? You can do that, that's possible with things like Ethereum and these contracts. Should we do that? Do we want to do that? But it's, a, it's ca possible now, and it's, ca it's capable. So these are the questions that are really fascinating to me. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that be prior, we, never had, we were never faced with this issue because we could not do it. it was, it's untenable. Now we can, and so now the next question is, are we sh should we, right? This is where the ethicists really need to, uh, to speak to this, because, it's, it, because we can doesn't mean we should. And if we get this wrong, it's really wrong, I guess. So one way to um, to play with the concept I like is that it's not necessarily the autonomy of the object, it's also the autonomy of the information. And because of this fact, it changed also a lot of things. So if I just play the game of doing the summary, IoT are a way of uh, connecting network, uh, sorry, to connect objects through a network. And the way we do it at Warner in the uh, industry is we develop huge infrastructure. You have different company with their own antenna, with their own protocol, with their own object, with their own, um, how do you say, uh, monthly fee for using the uh, sensors. And so it's very inefficient in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of deployment, the security is often shit because it's not being thought in the process. And so if you look at it from the information standpoint, the information, because as you were saying, uh, will be able to jump from different objects, it could also jump from different ecosystem, from different company, different platform. And so it's not so much from my point of view about the autonomy of the object, it's also about the autonomy of the information in it. And so when you push the concept even further, uh, the blockchain technology, as you've been uh, hearing for two days, is either you see it from the security standpoint or the autonomy uh, standpoint of being able to uh, have a transaction between people. And another way I like to see it is that um, it's also about efficiency and about mutualization of assets. Um, and in the scientific and technological community, for example, we have a protocol in place for centuries now where we are doing most of the time research and development in, on our side. And from a legal standpoint, it's very hard to collaborate with each other. You have patents, you have different licensing, you have different institutions. It could be a startup, it could be a company, university. And so when you combine them together, the cool thing that come out of it possibly is that um, you can change the way you are collaborating. The information could be able to jump from different researchers altogether. And also from the machine's uh, drone standpoint, you can do some cool stuff. So I just do uh, like a, um, and jump into uh, some use case. So let's say you are working on uh, drone autonomy and you have people who are right now like Chris, Will and uh, uh, his team developing nanosatellite who will probably the end of next year uh, complete coverage of the Earth uh, with a three to five meters resolution. The thing will be moving quickly. That being said, you have, and we will have complete view of the Earth. You will have drones, you will have altitude drones, you will have sensors all around. So that means the world is going to be a lot more transparent. Then the question becomes in terms of regulation and law, who have access to the information, who have been using it. And so once again, the blockchain is interesting because it's not just autonomy of the object, the information will be autonomous, but also you'll be able to track who's been doing what, who's been using this kind of thing. And that's quite exciting uh, for us. 
Yeah, I mean, and kind of go back to the killer app. So uh, the FTC just issued an interesting report um, to the National Highway Traffic Safety Authority about privacy and vehicle-to-vehicle communications. So especially once we have self-driving cars, but even now with human-driven cars, having data from the CPU of the car next to you about its acceleration, uh, its speed, uh, mass, all sorts of things that could be really useful to avoid collisions. Uh, but as soon as you start sharing that data, like what happens to it? So it's sort of a privacy question again. So if you're driving down a highway, even though your car isn't necessarily sharing anything with the internet, all the cars around you are creating an aggregate data set that can then create a model of your driving habits, right? If they're able to cross-correlate all of that data. But if you're able to encrypt it in a way that the car that's trying to avoid hitting you can utilize the data about your velocity and direction and how fast you're steering and things like that, then it can avoid the collision without that data necessarily being aggregatable in the long run. That, that reminds me, actually, um, killer app. I, I, I think a contender could be navigation system for drones. Because uh, to elaborate, I mean, you have this situation where you go and have untrusted, or you have devices that don't know each other, the drones, and they have they they come into ad hoc situations again and again, where they will have to negotiate right of way, just for them not to collide. And using the blockchain for that could be a real, um, real interesting uh, application, filling a real need that is coming up now. And to, to, to further this, and uh, what you are saying earlier about should we or should we not do this kind of thing, what Joy was saying earlier also is there is some kind of responsibility from the community for pushing this kind of question and uh, uh, development. And so I don't know if you've seen, but uh, yesterday, um, uh, friends at uh, Slokit with Stefan, Chris, and Simon uh, have been pushing what they've been calling the Ethereum uh, computer. And basically, it's uh, a way of having like uh, what Prima has been doing with the Plantoid uh, physical object that run the uh, blockchain and here uh, Ethereum protocol. And what's really interesting is with this kind of approach is that um, they are trying to push a platform where people can use, educate themselves, experiment, and deploy assets, which usually would require a company or sometimes even a governmental funding to be able to do it. And by the way, the thing is open source, so you can just remix it, you can play, hack with it, do whatever you want with it. Um, and what's really cool with it is that a lot of the people who are here in the conference on the panel are already doing research and at the same time trying to innovate with these kind of things. Um, and so uh, a few weeks ago when there was DEFCON in London, we organized with Slackit's uh, uh, workshop related bringing IoT with a blockchain. And what was really cool was the idea coming from the people. You had people trying to apply it for diving sensors logs. So when you are doing diving, you have some security assets, either for the people who are instructing you or even for yourself or your health. You had people trying to apply it for energy. And yesterday uh, we had some project that came out with this kind of uh, application for smart grid. And you have all these kind of ideas that are popping up and you have people who have access to this kind of technology that can try and play with it. And what will be really interesting is how does the community once again um, maximize the uh, knowledge, the skills that they have and try to collaborate to push this kind of thing. Because of the way and the nature of the technology is running, you can do things that there was just not possible before for this kind of research and development. So um, I guess also, when we talk about the Internet of Things, a, l a lot of time, most of the discussion goes indeed into the autonomy of devices, a more peer-to-peer -peer market, etc. Um, on the other hand, it is, of course, also possible that uh, the, the same technology, the blockchain technology, gets incorporated into devices, but not in giving autonomy in for to the device, but actually in a in a in a corporate way in the sense that the company actually maintain full control over those devices and incorporate the blockchain technology in order to let them transact on their own but under the control of the um, of the company and i think in this sense it actually raised this um this, the, this goes back to the initial discussion about are we moving from property right to access right which is interesting because actually we had in the at the time of uh, the discussion on copyright and digital environment we had this discussion with the digital right management system that uh, the technology that was being attached to the to digital content was actually eliminating the concept of owning a piece of content and it was more about accessing this piece of content which to some extent impinge upon like the, the right of individuals so are, are we actually 
is there also like, if we look at the other side of the internet of smart things, are we actually uh, perhaps also moving towards a system of digital height management system on objects, which means that there is the operator that actually can dictate exactly how we can use the object uh, how the object can interact with, uh, with, with other objects. And in this sense, this means that even though I own or I possess something, in fact, this thing is never really, I, I'm never actually ever free to use it as I wish because it's always dependent on how the, the blockchain transactions are set up. And if I'm not paying constantly for like the method use of my devices, I'm actually, I, I don't really have a device. So how, like, this, this goes more into like the non, so we, there are two ways of going into the dystopian vision of the Internet of Things. One is like the Skynet in which we have device that gets their own autonomy and eventually just start contracting on their own independently of human being. But I think there is another dystopian uh, side of it, which is when we, we enter into this really totalitarian system where every device is strictly and harshly controlled. Um, so is that like, do you see this as a, possibility? Do you see this as being likely? And if so, how can we actually try and avoid this from completely uh, eradicating the right of users behind the device? Yeah, well, I would say to, to take the optimistic view that what's interesting about the blockchain technology is actually that it's separating access and control in an interesting way, right? And this is, if, if you have a simple kind of communication system, access is control. You have access to all the information you can control the device and the output, but blockchain lets you strategically and systematically limit access and control, right? So what you, and it's not the device necessarily, but the information, right? That can be tokenized and encrypted and transmitted. Uh, so it's, it's a more abstract sort of level of indirection away from the object. So it may be very hard if we try to think about it controlling the object in a traditional sense. But if we think about access to the information in that device or the ability to access that device's operations through negotiating a contract with it, it's actually empowering. So we have a, new ways of sort of mediating that relationship that's not a traditional command and control, simple hierarchy, right? Um, it's, well, it's more let me show an example, which is an actual example. With, uh, for instance, now you can, you, you lease cars, and then you have to pay constantly the lease, and the day in which you stop paying the lease, the car doesn't turn on anymore, right? Or you can have, why not, your, uh, your uh, intelligent fridge that eventually refused to open up because you didn't enter into another smart contract, et cetera. So as we get into this complexity of smart contract and device contracting with each other, et cetera, and then the individual that is actually supposed to interact with those devices, if you do not enter into those contracts as they are predefined, then you, you do not get access to this device anymore. Right, but if you think about the digital rights thing, right, so part of the way, I mean, part of it, why it didn't work was the technology didn't really work, right? So. One thing is like for you to listen to a song on your iPod by yourself. It's another thing if you broadcast that and, and sell tickets to some public event where you're rebroadcasting that song, right? That's a different kind of right to that access. But the technology right now can't know how, you know, how that system is being amplified and things like that. But potentially, that could be built in into a sophisticated enough you know, Ethereum smart contract to where it's able to detect, oh, I'm being played on a you know loud PA system to thousands of people. So that engages a different subcontract that has a different sort of payment structure than just playing it on your iPod. I, I think that's exactly my question. Like, do we actually want to enter into a society in which every single action can be monitored, controlled, and metered by technologies because every device is actually capable now of uh, metering itself? Well, well, I mean, but again, so uh, all of this assumes you can figure out the privacy part, which I'm hopeful the blockchain is going to be able to do, but uh, not, not assured. And maybe Filament's going to do it for us. but. Um, the idea is because it's distributed, like actually the, the central authority, so whoever even owns maybe that digital right uh, to that work, may not know about the performance or the, the playback, right? Because they, they wouldn't necessarily have access to it. Eventually they'll get remunerated through the system for it, but they may not actually be able to determine where that's been played and when. If they're not given access to that piece of information, they're, necess they're not necessarily so it's not a sort of total control over uh, everything, right? Uh, That's uh, where access and control become 
associated. I, I would argue that uh, the main criticism that we had on uh, digital health management system was actually that uh, it was forgetting about fair use, right? So there are in the law, there are many ways in which people actually should be entitled to use content in a way that perhaps was not contemplated by the technical mechanism that was actually constricting access. And so m my question here is more, do we actually want technological designer, architect, or the people that are designing those devices and incorporating smart contracts into it to actually have the right to decide exactly and strictly speaking how people will be able to use those devices? So when I buy my fridge, it's not about just what are the capabilities of the fridge in terms of a technical infrastructure, but it's what is the capability of the fridge designed and encoded into it by the person that created the smart contracts related to this fridge. So in this sense, my rights towards my objects, whether it's a car, a fridge, or anything else, are not dictated by the, by the physicality of it, but are dictated by the, by the smart contract designer, which is oftentimes a, a, a corporate company. So uh, if I major on this uh, on this side, the first one is that actually it's really the case. I mean, you don't own your information. We are in a world where the business side of it is that you are giving for free your information. It's been uh, analyzed. The information either by purely or by uh, being um, uh, mined will be sold to a third party. And so when you put your information on Flickr, on Twitter, on Facebook, basically what you do is you allow a company to uh, uh, provide you the service so you don't pay your very little. But in exchange, the information is going to be third, uh, sold to a third party. Um, and so when you look at the Internet of Things, there is no reason to think about it's going to be different at the moment. And actually, when you look at the way the world is working already, it's a completely algorithmic way of doing things. And we already gave control of a lot of things through this kind of thing. Uh, people like uh, Daniel Suarez in Demons and Freedom have been writing expansively on this kind of thing. It's If you haven't read the book, they are brilliant to think about this kind of topics. And the second thing is, I forget what was the second thing is. Yeah, um, when you are doing this kind of thing, then when you apply this kind of um, um, big structure that are very compartmentalized, the information can jump. So uh, with blockchain, that could be possible is that if you could put your information on Facebook and then it can jump to Twitter, it can jump to another one, and you can have a traceability of this kind of utility and who's been selling it, then from a business standpoint, maybe there is some incentive that could be pushed, but uh, it's still very skeptical because of the way the world is working and turning, so it will be interesting to see what comes out of it. I would like to um, propose a different viewpoint there. You, you said that there's no reason to expect things will change, but. Um, while I agree that we already have this situation now, um, I think it will get so much worse what the effect is on um, consumers if all their things all of a sudden do the same thing and then like their Twitter account does now, that this will lead to a backslash. And this is exactly why uh, IBM came out with this paper, Device Democracy, where the point is being made that for business it's not going to be good if customers have to have this kind of fishy feeling for their uh, all of their devices that they use, like we now have for our Twitter account, for our Gmail account, and all that. And I think nobody likes that anymore. There's really, really few people who are just don't care and have their, all their email being read by Google. Um, and, and going forward, of course, there's this other side where um, billing by the hour or billing by the CPU cycle or billing by flight hour seems to be a better but also a fairer business. Um, because the bottom line is if, if the manufacturer makes more money for this, from this kind of billing, and this is why they're pushing it through. But it's also uh, obviously the better business because people or customers like to buy that because by that they can make better business plans because they are not like, locked in into something where they kind of have to provide the insurance implicitly um, through their own funding how the business is going to go. But they kind of can push that off to the actual provider or, to, or the manufacturer of the devices they are going to be using. That is intrinsically a very good thing. So there's a good reason why we have the situation that all this data uh, in the moment is um, uh, provided, is used uh, on this access base. And maybe there's a way to be found that we can both have this kind of better economy, but combining that with privacy that in the end is what the customer wants. And that in the end is really a thing about consumer awareness. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I'm going to go back to what Primavera originally asked about too, about um, is that the world we want to live in, right? The, the dual dystopia that we're kind of pre presented with. And 
You know, I, I may be going out on a limb here saying this, but I, I like to think that working with a group of people like the people in this room and, and the larger you know, blockchain community, that if we can figure out some of these things correctly and we can actually have the devices um, enforce the rules by which we all want to live with these devices um, in a way that's transparent and auditable using blockchain and things like this, I prefer that to the siloization and corporatism that, that nobody knows how our data is used today. Like, I think we can do better and still have devices that are fairly autonomous. Now, it, it leads to a lot of questions, but I, you know, there's no reason to believe, I don't think, that you could actually look at these devices in this instance as little um, uh, participants, um, even, even um, what's a good word, uh, regulatory or governing entities that can help enforce their little rule set that we as a society and community agree upon, which might mean something like, you know what, like the data that's present, that's created here that you create, the smart contract says it is rights by you only and does not go to the, the manufacturer, does not go anywhere else unless you explicitly opt in and agree to it. That can be encoded. That can be codified onto a smart contract. Now there's, there's there were, uh, people up here yesterday on, on the panel, uh, Virgil and his group working on what does it mean when you need to move into like the real realm of legal smart contracts out of the code side. Um, there's work being done in that area. And I think that that's where we can start to look at as kind of a gray area or a way where we can start to see that that governing ourselves and building the society we want to live in can actually be uh, augmented by leveraging some of these devices uh, acting on our behalf. And if we help kind of shape that kind of direction and make it so that it's expected by manufacturers to adhere to a basic modicum of, of social privacy and, and responsibility, then we won't buy the devices that do those things because there'll be another one that comes by, another company that says, we know that companies don't want to do this and we want to sell more. And so, you know, not leveraging too much on the free market concepts because those can be abused and they are and tragedy of the commons and things like that. I think there's some balance there that will help fix that feedback loop to some degree. But fundamentally, we decide what should go on those devices. And if we don't like what's on the devices, then we shouldn't buy them. We shouldn't pay for them. Um, it might be idealistic, but I, I, I'm more hopeful for that than what I've seen in large corporations <laughs> up until this point. I, I guess one thing that, that goes into that discussion is uh, which blockchain you would use for the IoT devices. So um, I think in the discussion so far, we, uh, we mainly talked about using public blockchains uh, for the examples that we're, we're talking about. But um, if you look at, for example, the IBM project, uh, they're uh, experimenting with launching a private chain, which would be um, perhaps based on Ethereum and have uh, different properties compared to a, a public chain. Um, and that, that's something that could affect uh, these things around access and control, um, who actually controls the blockchain, and where does that security come from? Um, and also, uh, Primavera talked about the cost of uh, transactions or the cost of um, smart contracts in these devices. And for example, if you launch a private chain um, as, a, as a corporation, you could put a lot of uh, security uh, behind that and actually enable it to have uh, zero transaction fees. Um, so I think that's something that has to be taken into consideration in this discussion is um, uh, which blockchain are, are we talking about when we deploy these devices? That, that's, super, that's a super interesting point right there. And I, I would like to both uh, say where I agree and where I would like to correct it. And uh, um, first of all, I mean, it points to how important it is also for the developers uh, to be aware of what, where, what we're in and what is demanded right now and where we're going. And for example, I mean, uh, Eric's company, Filament, um, even Ethereum is using Telehash, <coughs> which uh, Filament came up with Whisper, is, using, is based on Telehash, which is something, coincidentally, I mean, Samsung has been using it, uh, IBM has been using it for Adept, and this is uh, because there is nothing else that gives those privacy um, guarantee that Telehash can on that deep protocol level, right? So Filament is an absolutely pioneer, making things possible, making it possible to propose something to consumers that before was not possible. Now, my question to Ethereum, of course, then becomes, um, when we look at a private network or a public network, I can assure you, um, my understanding at this point is that the project we're working at, we absolutely want it to be on the public network, but one of the major problems we are having that we were discussing earlier is privacy. So immediately the question comes back, how are you prioritizing privacy of transactions for the public Ethereum network? That's a, that's a really good question, and it's something that um, might be related to uh, the research in zero knowledge proofs 
that might might give the solution to have that privacy on public chains. But I think before we see that, uh, we may see um, uh, before we see that on public uh, blockchains, we may see private chains being used to guarantee uh, privacy to some extent. Um, but there was also mention of using um, encrypted data, and uh, one one capability that. Uh, Ethereum um, is actually the first blockchain system to really, really have is that uh, smart contracts have um, they have their own individual storage. So if you map, for example, a smart contract to one uh, IoT device, they can have um, their own uh, storage where you they could put private, they could put encrypted data, uh, and then you, it enables you to do things like um, putting that encrypted data on the blockchain and then later uh, releasing the key to decrypt it to prove that you actually put some data. But then you gain privacy for some um, for some time, uh, perhaps for a week, if we're talking about sensors for traffic or so. Thank you. I think we n we should open uh, the to the audience if you have any questions. Uh, w while they are looking for the question, just uh, which is cool with the audience, there is probably a lot of people in a lot of different industry. What I would push is from your own point of view, your own industry, instead of just thinking about the regulation aspect, what are the opportunity for your own business to be applying this kind of thing that you are hearing about and how it could be helped to even uh, create new business market for yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Paul from APNIC, the IP address registry for. Um, Asia Pacific. Um, we spent a fair, fair bit of time talking about this, but mostly at the infrastructure level, uh, mostly uh, stressing the need for IPv6, for instance, to make this, this stuff work well. Um, it's, uh, it's great to talk about smart things on the net, um, but for the security and, and the stability of the net, we need to make sure that the smarts go all the way down through the stack, because there are even uh, plenty of dumb devices on the net which um, we don't expect too much for, from. But in a lot of cases, they're doing really stupid things. And this is, this is basic stuff. And even, even internet companies have been guilty of um, you know, home routers that uh, launch inadvertent denial of service attacks on NTP servers because they do the wrong thing. Um, if anything's going to be, I mean, we might have smart um, devices as, as the killer app. But if something's going to kill the IoT or, and kill the internet because it's the same thing, then it'll be, it'll be devices doing dumb and stupid things. So, you know, manufacturers need to understand this and understand that you don't just get a device and plug it in and magically it's on the net. They actually need to, that manufacturing ecosystem, which is itself really complex, needs to interconnect really richly with a, an internet ecosystem at the standards layer and at the software and drives and up and down, up and down through the, through the stack. Uh, so if you want to Google internet of dumb things, there's a post on our blog um, by our chief scientist who warned about a few of these things. This is really down to earth stuff. It's really basic stuff. Um, so, you know, it's way below privacy and, and smart contracts and stuff, but it's a really essential thing um, if this thing's actually going to, going to take off. Thanks. I, I, I would actually like to add to this that uh, we also have to be careful when we're talking about the Internet of Smart Things that we are not turning people into dumb things. Um, most importantly, there is actually some discussion going on about like uh, autonomous self-driving cars, and indeed, like the, the the problem, the difficulty for ensuring that there is a security that uh, the, there will not be an accident between one self-driving car running into another. And in fact, uh, if, if if by reflecting on this, it seems that the danger is oftentimes not the smart uh, self-driving car running into another self-driving car, but it's about the car running into a, a, a human drive car because those are really unpredictable, right? And so in this sense, you can, you can actually argue, and some people are arguing that in order to actually ensure the safety on the roads, then it should actually only be self-driving cars because you can predict exactly how they're going to behave. You know that they will never enter into any kind of... Um, of accident, and um, so in this sense, like we, this, I think this is something that we we need to be careful. Is like as we automate most of uh, the activity, as our devices are becoming more and more able to to operate on their own, uh, as they become smarter and smarter, then what becomes to the individual that are actually using those devices? Do they actually lose their rights because they have to delegate to the to the to the devices? 
I mean, it kind of comes back to the private and public blockchain to some extent, but to what extent when you enter a space that's filled with all these devices, do you have any idea as an individual what those are doing or, or do law enforcement or regulators or, right? So what is the ability to sort of scrutinize what's actually happening in these things, ensuring that they're working the way they claim to be working? Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Linda. I'm from CBA. I have a question in regards to the identity um, and um, if any of you or the panel is actively working to try to resolve that uh, issue to have a digital identity which you could be utilized uh, better in a public blockchain domain. We, uh, I can speak quickly to that. I know we're running out of time. Um, we have a protocol that we're working on as part of the telehash protocol, which is what we talked about earlier, which is a communications protocol for device to device, really end to end. So it could be web browser to device or web browser to web browser. But a sub protocol of that is called block name, which is, uh, deals with device identity and discovery, um, where we actually store a digital version of the device's identity in the blockchain. And then we, um, very quickly, is very ma vastly over Sarah, under, under described, but uh, uses 90% of the DNS infrastructure for lookup. But instead of the 13 root name servers that you have with ICANN, you replace that with blockchain. And so this is very similar to things like people are doing with one name, Ryan, and, and that group over there. But they're doing it mostly for people first, and we're trying to do it for devices because we need it for devices. Because you can't discover a device and transact with it if you can't even you know discover it or find where it's at. So. Block name, it's, it's, a, it's a white paper that's coming out soon. Um, we'll have the protocol spec up on GitHub already. So if you wanted to get in the guts, that's what we use for that. One last question. There's a very basic principle in consumer law. And, and whether you're offering for sale a service or a, a product and whatever business model you're you're using, and that is whatever you're selling has to be fit for purpose. And you're talking very much about these internet of smart things, these individual things becoming autonomous. And uh, in other forums, I've, I've heard words like, we can't predict what it will actually do, even though we're responsible for you know, the smart contracts and all of the programming. So uh, are you suggesting that um, this basic tenant of uh, being fit for purpose needs to be abandoned? Because that's what it, it sounds like. You're going to create all of these devices and they're going to go off and potentially do their own thing. Uh, it, it sounds like you're not going to take responsibility for that even though you're the creator. So I, I, I think it's very important to note that um, with blockchain systems uh, like Bitcoin or with Ethereum, um, you, can, you can basically engineer the level of uh, a, a, uh, autonomy in the device. So it's, it's up to you when you create these smart contracts, for example, uh, how autonomous they will be. So you can, you can launch a fully autonomous thing on a public blockchain and then, um, and then basically run away and there's no one that could, uh, could do much about it. But you could also engineer contracts where um, there is central, some central control in it. Uh, for example, one central um, corporation needs to um, uh, activate it in some way for it to function. And if I may add something on the uh, business uh, aspect of your question, what's really interesting is that for a lot of uh, company, uh, some of our clients in France, for example, are willing to put some research into trying to see if it's going to attack their business or if it's going to allow them to create new opportunity. And uh, with the Internet of Things, what's really interesting is that, as I was saying earlier, you have a lot of different companies, different protocols, different tools and everything, but they don't collaborate with each other. So if you apply the concept of uh, business network, um, uh, uh, sorry, social business network approach, then what happens is that you have a lot of different uh, uh, objects, you have a lot of different companies, you have a lot of different customers, but they always have to restart from zero when they are collaborating at multiple agents. So through this kind of network society, uh, um, uh, object society approach, what happens is that you can have a mutualization of this kind of assets, you can uh, collaborate between different parties, and then you can produce new services that are just not possible. And because of the business aspect of IoT is just to sell or to use the information that's been produced from it because they are pretty dumb, then there is also a lot of opportunity. So it will be interesting to see what comes out of it. 
And I think I think the other way to think about autonomy um, is is about trust and confidence and predictability to some extent. So there's a lot of online trading algorithms that are in some sense unpredictable. You don't know when they're going to trade or how much they're going to trade, right? Once you release them into the system, but you test it and you get a certain confidence, uh, and you also have a stake, right? So I think having humans or businesses that have a stake in what the system does, it's not fully autonomous in that it sort of owns itself and it's out determining its existence in the world like a, you know, a Kantian subject, right? Um, but there's somebody who's tested it and has confidence that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Within a realm of understanding, there's another realm that's uncertainty and risk, and you know, that's where insurance and uh, risk management comes in. Thank you, you actually haven't um, answered the question I asked, which was whether you believe that you as creators of these Internet of Things are actually uh, going to guarantee that they're fit for purpose, especially if they go off and do things that you can't predict. I, real quick, I would argue that um, we, as devices get smarter, they are, you, you need to define fit for purpose now. Because if a device can sell 15 different sensor data to 15 or 20 different customers, and their end fit for purpose are very different things, even in different industrial verticals, what does fit for purpose mean now? So we, I, would, I would answer your question with another question, is that we need to define what fit for purpose is, and then we can start talking about use cases and levels of quality, quality of service, all those other things that come along with the device that needs to do what it says it does. What does it do? We need to define that first. Thank you. Thank you. We're out of time, but uh, thank you a lot for all the panelists, and um, we now have the panel.